Good morning. Welcome to Mission Control Houston. You've got a live look at the international at the International Space Station's Flight Control Room. Members of the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers are here monitoring station systems and working with the crew members in the last few hours of their scheduled work week. Expedition 58 Commander Oleg Kononenko and Flight Engineers Anne McLean and David St. Jacques spent some of their time this week on station maintenance. A bigger hunk of their time was spent on science experiments while making preparations for a thing that no self-respecting space station should be without a new flying robot. Up until now, it's been governments that have sent people into space. And, you know, working with our NASA partners, we are on the doorstep of being able to open it up to a much greater population. A hundred years ago, the average person would say, buy a ticket, I, I will never fly an airplane, and I will never be able to buy a ticket to go in an airplane. We might really be able to do that someday. So you can't think in today. You have to think about what's it going to be like tomorrow. Having multiple ways to get to low Earth orbit and to get home from low Earth orbit safely is a, a huge step forward for all of human spaceflight. You know, when we first looked at the business case, it was primarily focused around NASA. And we continue to look at people who are interested in actually flying full service missions up to low Earth orbit, whether it be the space station or another destination. Commercial industry should be allowed to thrive in the space marketplace to allow innovation in the space industry to go to the next level. We are so excited about partnering with NASA in this innovation and bringing it to the next level together. The more that you open up those challenges um, and those, uh, those goals to, to the larger, broader industry, then the better ideas you're going to get and the more creativity that's going to be spawned from that and the more opportunities that I think it creates for our country. As I go out and do talks and tell people about what it was like to fly in space and uh, talk about how we're going to go on to you know, the moon and Mars, but I tell them, hey, it's not going to be me. As I'm talking to classrooms of kids, I say, it's going to be you guys. We really need to inspire the next generation because they're going to be the pioneers for the future. Commercial crew program now just about two weeks out from the target launch date for the first flight test of the Crew Dragon spacecraft, which of course being developed in parallel with Boeing's Starliner under NASA's commercial crew program that was a look at uh, some of the uh, ideas about what's going to happen off into the future as commercial crew makes it possible for more than just government astronauts to actually get to space. But that's who's there right now. And here's a look at what Kononenko, McLean, and Sinjak have been up to this past week. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground, I'm Isidro Reyna. The science continues aboard the International Space Station. This week, the crew made preparations for the arrival of Astrobee, a self-contained free-flying robot that will be flying around the station alongside astronauts later this year. Astrobee will help scientists and engineers develop and test technologies for use in zero gravity, help the astronauts do their routine chores, and give flight controllers in Houston additional eyes and ears on the station. The autonomous robot, powered by fans and vision-based navigation, will perform crew monitoring, sampling, logistics management, and accommodate up to three investigations. Astrobee builds on the success of Spheres, NASA's first generation free flyer now aboard the station. Life in microgravity reproduces many effects encountered on Earth by people during prolonged bed stays in intensive care, persons with reduced mobility or with aging. A better understanding of the relationship between fat cells and blood-producing cells in the bone marrow is key to minimize the impact of decreased activity in our society. Astronauts on the station worked on the marrow investigation, which looks at the effect of microgravity on the bone marrow. It is believed that microgravity, like long-duration bed rest on Earth, has a negative effect on the bone marrow and the blood cells that are produced in the bone marrow. The extent of this effect and its recovery are of interest to space research and healthcare providers on Earth. This week's question comes from Caitlin of RJO Intermediate School. She wants to know what's the longest amount of time an astronaut or cosmonaut has spent in space? Well, that's a great question, Caitlin. We'll have to take a look back into our archives. The Russian space station Mir endured 15 years in orbit, three times its planned lifetime. 
It hosted scores of crew members, including physician Valery Polyakov, who lived aboard Mir for a single continuous orbit stay of 438 days. He completed his stay in 1995. In comparison, and most recently, retired NASA astronaut and Expedition 46 Commander Scott Kelly and his Russian counterpart Mikhail Kornienko spent 340 days aboard the International Space Station. They completed their mission in 2016. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag space to ground. We'll see you next week. The International Space Station serves as a one-of-a-kind platform for scientific research, as some you just saw there. It's taking advantage of the microgravity conditions to perform experiments that can't be done down here on the planet. That includes experiments in a new atomic refrigerator that's capable of cooling matter down to just above the point where, in theory, the thermal activity of the atoms comes to a stop. Cool Science on the International Space Station. Presented by Science at NASA. NASA researchers are creating a spot colder than the vacuum of space inside the International Space Station. It's called the Cold Atom Lab, or CAL, and it can refrigerate matter to one ten billionth of a degree above absolute zero just above the point where all the thermal activity of atoms theoretically stops. At this temperature, atoms lose their energy and start to move very slowly, explains Rob Thompson, Cal Project Scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. At room temperature, atoms bounce off each other in all directions, at a few hundred meters per second. But in Cal, they'll slow down a millionfold and condense into unique states of quantum matter. CAL is a multi-user facility that supports many investigators studying a broad range of topics. Eric Cornell, a physicist at the University of Colorado and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, will be leading one of the first CAL experiments. Cornell and his team will use CAL to investigate particle collisions and how particles interact with one another. Ultra-cold gases produced by the Cold Atom Lab can contain molecules with three atoms each, but which are a thousand times bigger than a typical molecule. This results in a low-density, fluffy molecule that quickly falls apart unless it is kept extremely cold. How is particle behavior affected as more particles are introduced? What can be learned about quantum objects when several atoms are interacting at the same time? Cornell says the way atoms behave in this state gets very complex, surprising, and counterintuitive, and that's why we're doing this. Cornell shared the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physics for creating Bose-Einstein condensates, another state of quantum matter that can be studied inside Cal. Bose-Einstein condensates are essentially blobs of quantum matter that look and behave like waves that exist at these ultra-cold temperatures. In the free fall of space, the condensates can hold their wave-like forms for 5 to 10 seconds, much longer than on Earth, providing researchers a window into the quantum realm. Thompson says we can use Cal to test general relativity and quantum mechanics. One of the biggest questions in physics today is how those two work together. University of Rochester physicist Nick Bigelow and University of Berkeley scientist Holger Mueller, along with their colleagues, plan to use Cal to test a cornerstone of Einstein's theory of relativity, the equivalence principle which holds that gravity and external acceleration cannot be distinguished experimentally. They plan to repeat Galileo's iconic experiment dropping cannonballs off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but using atoms instead. Dropping atoms inside Cal and letting them fall for several seconds as the station orbits Earth will allow researchers to precisely figure out the differences between how the atoms accelerate. This experiment may reveal how gravity and space-time are woven through the quantum realm. A researcher at JPL named Jason Williams also plans to use ultra-cold two-atom molecules to develop tools for the next generation of precision gravity tests with quantum gases. Many more experiments are planned for this cool new laboratory, and no one knows where they will lead. With Cal, says Thompson, 
we're entering the unknown. For more from the International Space Station, visit www.nasa.gov station. For cutting edge physics on and around Earth, stay tuned to science.nasa.gov. For the International Space Station crew members, establishing a routine for sleep is a key component of them being able to function to the best of their ability. In this demonstration video, astronaut Ricky Arnold talks about some of the problems with sleep in space and how the astronauts overcome them. Hi, my name is Ricky Arnold on the International Space Station. We get asked a lot, how do we sleep in space? And it's a great question because we all know how important a good night's sleep is. Um, if you're not getting a good night's sleep, you can count on reduced cognitive function, poorer reaction times, and maybe just being a little grumpy. And up here in space, just like on Earth, those are things we all want to avoid. So we go around the Earth about every 90 minutes, which means we get 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. So how we sleep is a really good question because the sun's always getting ready to come up or it's getting ready to set. And we use those cues on Earth to let us know when it's time to begin our day and when it's time to end our day. Ricky is talking about circadian rhythm. It's the body's natural regulator for sleep and wake cycles based on a 24-hour schedule. Those 16 sunrises and sunsets he mentioned can cause circadian misalignment and sleep deficiencies during long-duration spaceflight. The hazards of lost sleep can range from poor attention at school to on-the-job errors to long-term sleep loss, even chronic disease. Sleep is super important. Hey, Ricky, what are you doing on the space station to get some sleep? Well, here in space, we kind of have to do it artificially. So we have these nice crew quarters. It's about the size of a refrigerator. It's very quiet. Um, the space station can be a little noisy, but it's very quiet in here. Um, and we can control light with a light switch. If we uh, are just middle of the day, we have a light, a light like you're seeing right now, which is just this kind of standard lighting. It's getting close to the end of the evening. You want to dim the light a little bit, kind of for the end of the evening. Or if you're going to be up late, you need to keep awake, we have a really bright light setting. The other thing we have is off. You see how dark it got. Um, Another challenge sleeping on the International Space Station, sleeping in microgravity is really nice because you can just float and stretch out and it's really comfortable. The problem is with the air currents in the International Space Station, you could very well float into a piece of hardware and hit your head or worse yet, even break something. So we got our sleeping bag here, just almost like a sleeping bag on Earth. But as you can see, we have bungee cords that help hold us up against the wall. So I almost sleep standing up and also, I do have a pillow, it's just a bag full of, uh, of clothes, but I actually keep it up on the top of my head because I'm a little tall in the crew quarters. I tend to hit my head on the ceiling when I'm sleeping. So I got my sleeping bag here. I got my bungee cords to hold me in. And then when it's time to go to bed, it's quite easy. Just unzip the sleeping bag, climb on under the bungee cord, climb into the sleeping bag, make sure you're nice and secure, Zip yourself up, plan on getting a good night's sleep so I have good reaction times, my cognitive ability is what it should be, and that I'm not grumpy in the morning. So with that, I'm all set. Good night from the ISS. sleep and food, basic human needs. Well, the food for the crew on the International Space Station is carefully chosen for its nutritional value and then specially prepared and packaged so that it's easily accessible in a weightless world on orbit. Could the same food feed the needs of people stuck on planet Earth? Well, probably, but we conducted an experiment to find out how well two regular people could get by eating only astronaut food for a full week. Here's how they fared. I've always 
thought like, oh my gosh, when you go to space, like you don't have to grocery shop for like six months. I think it's gonna actually put me on a schedule for eating. I am horrible at eating at all hours of the night. I miss lunch. Uh, we're also talking about like beverages. Like we can probably only drink powdered beverages or water. So nothing, no sodas. No sodas. Nothing carbonated. No. Yeah, no <laughs> just. I think it'll be a little bit more healthy than what I normally eat. Plus, I get to eat everything with tortillas, and I'm from yeah. San Antonio, so. <laughs> I will say we are doing this over a holiday weekend. We have huge barbecues and yeah. lots of great food, so I think I'm going to want to eat some really good ribs and, you know, and like fucking snacks. Uh, solemnly swear to eat all of the astronaut food and not cheat. Never. Never. We're in this together, so if we feel Never, weak, ever, ever. we'll text each other. Maybe. <laughs> we chose seven days out of the standard menu. You're going to have uh, a protein, some carb, some fruit. The other large category of products that we have are thermostabilized products. As which is a, sort of like a military ration that we don't have to uh, refrigerate uh, to keep fresh. Can't do them in a microwave. I was going to say, it looks oil. like something that can't go in a microwave. I was going to ask because I didn't want to find that out the hard way. Yeah. Um, we also have rehydratable food, which is this type in a vacuum pack where we have to add water, either hot or cold. We're going to give you a syringe. Oh. I don't um, like needles. And, and it comes with a needle. So this is you how carry you that would rehydrate. You. Okay. I don't think we would want to have that laying around our office. Can I take that through airport security? Yeah. <laughs> it is the day before we start the food challenge, and I just went to go pick up all the materials from our wonderful food lab. So they're all packaged and in my trunk. I asked them what I should eat as my last uh, real meal, and they said something fresh, maybe a salad. The problem is I was thinking nachos, so... As I suspected, I wouldn't have time to eat in the airport. I'm probably going to grab something to eat on the fly. Hopefully there's some tacos. So like I said, I was debating healthy or, uh, you know, not healthy. Of course, uh, I chose nachos. I did end up picking up some tacos, some shrimp tacos, actually, with some rice and some beans. Um, I told you I love tacos. I think it's important to always choose nachos, so I'm going to call this hashtag she chose nachos. She chose nachos. He chose tacos. So I have beef and mushrooms, rice pilaf, tomato and artichokes, and a wheat flatbread. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have grilled chicken, mac and cheese, vegetarian chili. We're in Texas, come on. <laughs> Cran apple dessert. Oh man, I already, remember she told us to tear it so there's no extra pieces of trash. Oh, so like if we were in space, so this like would this. all be floating around. Yeah. Everywhere. Once we open those packages, the food is what we consider to be liberated and it can just float anywhere. And sometimes you find yourself using your spoon or your mouth to, to chase around the food. And make sure you get it all in your mouth instead of stuck against the wall or somebody's face. Let's heat up a bowl of water and set these green That's ones in there. Idea. Yeah. Like it's getting to be the right consistency. Yeah. yeah. We might have not done hot enough water too. That might be why it's not absorbing like all the way. Okay, oh, okay well. this is good. <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> it's not bad. Wait a minute, what was this? This oh, is, good. is good. We have the artichokes and tomatoes mm -hmm. are good too. Should I try and eat it like this? Yeah. Ooh. You should have just got straws, like it'd be like Right. This is making my day. Like, this is a treat. I have cran apple dessert. This would remind me of home. Yum. So it's been a long day, but I did not get hungry at all. I had my butterscotch pudding as part one of my snack. I was wondering if the workouts would be hard. They're pretty much the same. I feel really high energy and I didn't even have coffee this morning. I'm actually really excited about this chicken corn and bean. This potato medley actually looks like some potatoes with spices and melted cheese on it. I'm very excited to get some melted cheese texture up in here. The little butter cookies look really delicious and super bougie. So you'll see I have um, some Caribbean chicken, pesto pasta with some corn, tortillas, vanilla pudding, and some pears. I got a little bit better at actually making the space food today, but I punctured the, the actual corn. I cut through it, so I had to rehydrate it through the side. Um, so lesson learned, this smells absolutely 
delicious. It's my boyfriend's last day at his old job, so one of his favorite clients brought him these delicious, huge-looking cupcakes, so none for me. Ooh! <laughs> Do you see that? This is science, y'all. So be a nurse now. I get <laughs> My mom would be proud. Like, mom, I'm doing nurse things today. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, okay, this looks like oatmeal. Do PR for NASA, they said. It'd be fun. <laughs> What are you having for lunch? What's your, your main? I have citrus salad, and then my main thing is fiesta chicken. Ooh, I love fiesta. Yeah, and rice, <laughs> yeah, yeah, rice with butter. And so tacos. I'm really excited because I think our food's gonna be warmer today. I, I agree. I think we did this right with some practice yesterday. <laughs> this is some smoked turkey. And then some cauliflower. I'm not a fan of this. Um, Today we're eating in the LBJ room. So President LBJ um, is who Johnson Space Center is named after. We should do a toast. Oh, we President should. Johnson. Go LBJ. Woo! Woo. <laughs> oh, mine's closed. <laughs> and so here we go. Mmm, this is really good. This is the, the chicken noodles. Let's try some of this green bean. Oh, that could use some hot sauce. The lentil soup. Hot. Ooh, hot. See, um, these are actually my tortillas. Astronauts on board the International Space Station can actually eat tortillas, and it's one of the things that they like to do because you can pretty much grab anything that's floating in space with them. Two quick miscellaneous notes. I've been living a really scheduled life and waking up early and going to bed early because I've been having to wake up with enough time to make breakfast, and then I go to bed shortly after dinner just so I don't get hungry again. I think Dan has a burrito. <laughs> oh, I yeah. I am jealous right now. I went for pee. And queso. Oh. Oh. Apples, Apples, fresh fruit. Which may or may not be organic. My <laughs> snack was chicken in a pouch. So. <laughs> Mine was tuna yeah. in a pouch. <laughs> I was just at the mall and whew, that was a week time because all of my friends I got some really good appetizers and when you're just all sitting around the table together it's I had to really stop myself a couple times to not mindlessly uh, reach for some of their chips or pretzels. What are you eating? Um, a cupcake. And what is Isidro eating? Space chocolate. Space chocolate. Yeah. How do you feel about the astronaut candy? Can you tell which one's the space food and which one is our regular Easter meal here? Hey guys, what are y'all making? Astronaut burgers. My family gets to eat this delicious grilled food and I get to eat a kind of brisket, a space brisket and baked barbecue beans. So we'll see how that ends up being. <laughs> See this? Oh, it's coming apart. Oh, no! Oh, Save the it's Monday, so we're done at Wednesday morning. We're really ready to be done. The weekend was hard. I was not able to eat any of the food that was at the festival. Um, I, there were some jalapeno corn dogs, and I'm like, that sounds so good. what is life right, right now? I, I can't even. <laughs> and we have curry chicken, green beans, and potatoes. The potatoes have been iffy, but these look better than some of the ones. Mm -hmm. Cream of mushroom soup. Oh. A little bit of India, a little bit of Texas with this countryness. I'm so ready for this to be over. Yeah, we're ready. We're I need my social life back. Yeah, no, I'm right. just having milk today. Powdered milk. Ah! We're nervous about the gas or the milk. I'm more nervous about the milk, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but something that I noticed while we've been eating this food is you have to have it really hot. On the space station, we put it in a kind of a, it's almost like an easy bake oven. Okay. Where you just, and that does make a really big difference. So, <laughs> I gotta admit, when I was making lunch this morning, I wasn't thinking this was gonna be on camera. <laughs> Leftover rice, some turkey. But some, it's uh, home cooked. It's definitely home cooked. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fan of the garlic paste. Garlic paste. That could fix anything. Hey, question, can you chew gum in space? Yes. Okay, because okay. garlic, you know, bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't trying to impress any of my crew members. We would use what we call food glue. 
something. Oh, just make, <laughs> make up something. Spray some olive oil in there to try to get everything to stick together a little bit. Yes. Or like I said, the garlic paste worked well for me. <laughs> what? When you get a few people with rice in their eye, then after that, you figure something out. <laughs> You know, it's a lot easier in space because we don't have to load the syringe. Like, if you were trying to measure out 250 milliliters of water or, or 100 milliliters of water, we literally just dial that number mm. and then press the button for hot or cold water. Mm. So talk to me about tacos in space. Tortillas, are they great to have up there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no <laughs> it just floated on this plate. <laughs> Gosh, if we had salsa, we did have salsa sometimes. You could put that on there. The salsa will stick to the bread. You can use the salsa for other things to stick to the salsa. I'm from San Antonio, and I love tacos. So I told everyone I would make a space a taco. taco. Yeah. So it's a little bit leaky, extra that moist. Happen in space. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't drip off the edges. It just makes a bubble. Got to do the taco tilt because <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is good stuff. That's awesome. This was the Mexican scrambled eggs food lab. They know what they're doing. We got some scientists back there. So is there anything that you Ooh, we did it. Way better than the LBJ toast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite meal. I actually really liked a lot of the breakfast food. Um, and the shrimp cocktail was in fact very good. Ooh, shrimp cocktail. But the scrambled eggs in a taco. <laughs> Ugh, man. Sorry. <laughs> Done. And maybe if I had a machine to kind of heat everything up. If I was sealed away from the outside world and I didn't have all those temptations, <laughs> maybe. Maybe if the food was floating around me, but I don't think I would otherwise. We could maybe do that. if I were an astronaut. <laughs> so I was debating, uh, this is the same debate I started with, <laughs> nachos or a salad. You get them both. I'll get both. I, I mean, get listen, both. at this point, yeah. I think we need to treat ourselves. Oh, for sure. But I can tell you, I really want some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> some nice, Regular coffee. hot coffee. Like a latte. I, I, I gotta get some coffee. And a soda. Yeah. <laughs> this is not easy, y'all. I'm telling you. If you'd like to get another look at that story or any of the other stories we showed you today, check us out on YouTube and on Facebook, and there are the addresses in the handy blue box. And while you're at either one of those sites, look around, because there's a lot of other cool stuff you can find about NASA and America's human spaceflight program. Now, while you're bumping around on the interwebs, too, you should also check out Houston We Have a Podcast. Folks here at NASA talking about their work in all aspects of space exploration. Uh, the new episodes post on Fridays, so today, Gary Jordan learns more about the Orion spacecraft in a conversation with John Lewis, the man leading the work here at the Johnson Space Center to develop the environmental control and life support systems for the new spacecraft that will take future astronauts beyond low Earth orbit. Go to nasa.gov slash podcasts. You'll find today's episode and all of the yesterday's episodes. In fact, you will find the full library of all of the NASA podcasts, and they are pretty cool, too. You can also listen to any of them on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. This is Mission Control Houston. Thank you.